50% of your fractures produce 80% of your hydrocarbons. That lends a lot of credibility. You know, if you come in and can be upfront and honest and say, you know, actually in this application, I think this product over here that I don't represent would be better for you. That all of a sudden now you become a trusted advisor rather than a salesman. And, you know, I often say that we have uh, all the requirements of space, right? Because it has to go underground and send us data from, from miles and miles away. And it has to work like failure is not an option. Uh, we'll put on, you know, a standard meal shoe. Ours is slightly different just for that, but it's, you know, everybody's got one. The top drive and the drawer works really don't care whether the electrons coming at it are from a joystick or a PLC. The, the panel, what you see here on the left, which is uh, now controlled by uh, one of my students, uh, is showing you actually uh, the control of our brake. As of now, geothermal is a pretty small, pretty small market. If you have torch velocity, the, uh, the casing will be up against the side on part of the well. There won't be any cement there. The cement will have crescent around it. So managed pressure drilling, it's been defined as a process to precisely control the pressure profile in the well bore. The key is being transparent with our clients in, in this case. So tell them what happened. If we had a failure, tell them exactly what happened. It, whether it's our fault, whether it's what, whatever the issue was, we need to yeah. be transparent. But I think it's very important for everyone in the industry to know what's out there and kind of what's happening downhole as well. I've probably worked on over 40 different performance limiters in my career. If I miss any of those and a computer is raising weight on bit and I miss any of those, I have a train wreck. The computer's going in the ocean. Here's your new colors, here's your new thing. Go and do that. Here's the all. tattoo you need to get. Yeah, here's the tattoo. Sorry about the last one. Um, <laughs> We used to fake that all the time. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Vitor Locksmith Show. I am so excited to be back here with you guys. I know I have taken a bit of time off, uh, but I... I needed the time off to be able to work on the, the actual business uh, that we have here, which is the main sponsor of the show. Hold on. Let's do this real quick. We'll put this up here in the top while wow, it's working. Gibson Reports, gibsonreports.com. If you're looking for directional drilling or MWD market share information or MWD directional drilling consulting uh, stuff, I can help out with that too. So uh, been very busy industry as of late. Uh, lots of things that are going on. Yesterday seemed to be a very popular day, but no information that I can share. I've told a whole bunch of things, but like I said, can't share it. Um, but I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Let's show, let's got some people watching from around the world. Uh, we've got tuning in from Saudi Arabia, Calgary, Colombia, Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, we've got LinkedIn user from Sweden, Trinidad and Tobago. I think this is the first time from somebody in uh, Trinidad. Uh, Andrew Quinlan in H-Town. Uh, Lee House says, welcome back. Lee, thank you for always joining in uh, here with the show. Uh, let's see, we've got... Brazil. Thank you guys for being here. This is absolutely awesome. Lee says he's in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, I need to make a trip down there. I've got a hankering for some... Uh, uh, I can't even think of the word now. It's, it's Louisiana Cajun food. I can't even think of the word now. It's all right. I've got so much going on in my brain right now because I'm so excited. We've got so many things to be able to like be able to talk about so uh we're still getting the numbers of uh, people watching still kind of ramping up i'm not even sure is the f okay so we do have uh so we're broadcasting on a new location today we are broadcasting actually on facebook as well i'm not sure if anybody even uses that platform anymore to discuss anything outside of conspiracy theories or political political stuff but we are broadcasting live on facebook youtube and on here on linkedin um, you know, LinkedIn, I guess, where most people join in to be able to watch. So thank you guys all for being here to be able to watch. Um, absolutely amazing show lined up here today. So make sure that I've got all of the things lined up here to be able to do stuff. So we've got a new segment today uh, or for the show. Uh, let me get at least comment off of there. That way. There we go. All right. We still got people uh, joining in here. So we got some more from Brazil. Carlos saying that. Thanks. Uh, Ian McCourt, old boss. Oh, I can't say that 
my former boss. He's going to get mad at me for saying an old joke. Uh, Ian McCourt and the guys over there. Merlin, thank you guys for, for joining in. Even BP with Iraq. Philip Maurice on Mexico. Wow. We really got – oh, Boudin. That's what I was looking for, Hank. Thanks. I've got a hanker for some Boudin. Want some bad. All right. I need to make a trip down there to go see my friends in Lafayette. There's a couple of my clients that are down there. That's what I was looking for. Uh, and then – Divine from Lagos, Nigeria. So we we're covering the entire world. We got people from all over the world uh, tuning in to be able to watch. This is absolutely amazing. Thank you guys for supporting me and 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 coming back after my, you know, two to taking two months off from the show. But we have got an absolutely stacked lineup coming up. So this week, this week we've got Angus Jameson. If you don't know who Angus Jameson is, shame on you. If you've ever heard of the 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 software Compass, right? He was the that. He's the guy that created that. Okay. Right. Like, trust me, you, if you are in the directional drilling MWD business, if you're in the drilling business in some way, shape, or form, Angus has had an impact on your career, whether you know it or not, he has. And in my personal opinion, Angus should never have worked in the oil and gas industry. He should have been a stand up comedian. Somewhere, somebody, some butterfly effect, something happened, and whoever was supposed to take him into the career of being a stand-up comedian, I don't know, showed up to the bar five minutes late, and then somebody from Oil & Gas showed up and was like, hey, you should come do this, and now he's in Oil & Gas instead of being a world-famous stand-up comedian. Absolutely hilarious guy. Love that the fact that he's going to be here on the show. So anyways, I'm blabbering on. I'm already six minutes into the show, and I'm supposed to be doing some other things. Uh, so stacked lineup. Angus Jamison this week. Uh, next week, we've got Fred Florence and David Reed to be able to talk about drilling automations and drilling mechanics and robotics. So thank you to those guys. The following week, Ed Stockhausen, once again, another individual. If you have not heard of him, he has ha has made an impact on you if you're in the drilling, MWD, direction drilling business. Uh, so we'll come on and we'll talk about the Stockhausen effect. The week after that, we've got Fred Dupriest. Obviously, man needs no further introductions. And we're kind of in back and forth talk. So there's a possibility that that, that show will be a two-part show. Um, so we'll probably do part one now and then part two later on when we can get it scheduled. We're, we're still working that out. Then we've got Matt Flannery uh, and or Graham Mensah Wilmot. I can't, we're trying to fix the schedules. Um, but Graham Mensah Wilmot um, is now a free agent and starting his own company. So he's going to be coming on the show. Really excited about that. Dr. Uh, Robello, um, he is essentially the professor when it comes to downhole drilling motors. And then after that, we've got David Ransom Wood for the I Told You So episode. And then after that, we'll be into December. At that point in time, we will be uh, doing other random things. So I do have a question for you guys. For everybody that is uh, tuning in, I want to ask, ah, that's not right. Uh, how many how many V-Door Locksmith episodes have you seen? I'm curious. If you guys can, comment in the comment box. How many episodes have you seen? Let me type this in because I didn't do it before the show. My episodes have you seen? And tell me how many you've seen and who has been your favorite guest. I want to see that in the comment section. So we're going to save that. Oops. All right. Ah, come on. There we go. Scroll the bottom ticker. There we go. Question. There we go. Now it's working. Should have done this all, all this stuff before the show. Anyways. Um, so then we also got something else. So this is absolutely something I'm really proud to be able to do. Pretty proud to be able to share. We hired somebody within the company to be able to um, help us out with some of the um, database projects that we've got going on. And this individual essentially stalked me online, did everything they were supposed to do to be able to catch my attention and to be able to get a job. Or they weren't even really trying to get a job. They were just trying to to help be a part and engage with me. And so what ended up happening is, is like I read the email at six o'clock in the morning. I got halfway through it and I was like, this is so professional. You're hired. And they were blown away. Um, Fahim Noor is, is, is an absolutely amazing person. He is very, very talented. If you were watching the show and you were looking for a young, eager, hungry, driven data scientist, right? Um, uh, artificial intelligence engineer, um, has a petroleum background. This this person is an absolute must hire. I really do wish I had the financial means and the projects right now to be able to bring this person on full time and keep them for myself, but I don't. And so the best that I can do for this person and being able to give back 
um, for everything that he's already done for us in in doing an artificial intelligence project within Gibson Reports is to be able to give him here a, a quick minute on the show. So we've got what we're calling now uh, the minute with Fahim. So there's a basic graphic and there we go. Fahim, welcome to the show. This minute is yours. This is your minute hey. with Fahim. Hello, what's up, everybody? How's it going? Thank you for tuning into the Vitor Locksmith Show. And David, sir, David is honestly the mentor of the year. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. I really do appreciate it. So my name is Fahim, and I'm here to talk to you about data. So I'm talking Python. I'm talking data science, machine learning, AI, all the buzzwords you can think of. I will be trying to bring the most interesting thing every week to you guys. Um, that's on my radar. So that like a gist of what this segment is supposed to be about and so let's just jump into this week so what i have for you this week is some python news because that is my most favorite language so i'm really excited about this so python 3.9 is coming out in three days so what is python i know a lot of our audience is not really from the coding background we're in the oil and gas industry i have a petroleum engineering degree so i'll just give a one line so python is basically a high level programming language, right? And just like any piece of software, you know, they come up with software updates and other fixes and 3.9 is coming out, who needs to worry, right? Um, as you know, when, when software goes into newer versions, they uh, discontinue older dependencies. So if you are someone who has code written in Python 2.7 or earlier versions, then you might have some problem running it if you have upgraded your system to 3.0 nine so that's something to keep in mind and 2.7 just to put it in perspective 2.7 was, was released mid of 2010 so a lot of the code that probably people wrote around that time was probably from 2.7 so just check the dependencies check back check your version and the other interesting thing that i want to mention is whenever they release a new version they do this bunch of tests like you know the speed of reading a variable or like how fast you can read a list. So they benchmark basically, right? They benchmark each version and have a set of like numbers, like how many milliseconds you needed to perform each test, right? And surprisingly, the newest version performs worse on literally every single benchmark, which is really funny. I don't know how that works, but the the the, the team claims that even though it doesn't show up on the on the benchmark reports, uh, you're supposed to be able to see some improved performances in certain areas. There is an article, I'll link it down somewhere so you can read more about which areas are actually going to uh, see the performance boost. And if you also want to see the whole table with like all the benchmarks and the actual numbers, I'll post that too. Um, I guess, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to share this week. It's probably almost been a minute. So um, I'll Time's just up. clean up. Yeah, no. time's up. Okay, you guys keep watching, and I'll be down in the comments. I'll be watching the rest of the show, so please stay tuned and keep watching, sharing, tag your friends, and yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're ready for this new season. Thanks, Fahim. I really do appreciate it, guys. I, honestly, I cannot say this enough. If you're looking for somebody, feel free to steal him away from me. As you can see, like I messaged him like two days ago, and I was like, hey, you're going to do a segment on my show. It's going to call me Minute with Fahim, and he was like, yeah, sure, and you know, he produces content. He's got energy. I think he's going to make a, a great addition to anybody's team. Um, I just want to put this on here real quick so that Angus can see it. Your boss is watching. Todd, thanks for tuning in, man. I appreciate that. So we've got a couple of people to be able to say uh, the, the episodes that they've seen. This will be my first. All right. Andrew says he's seen about a dozen. This one's kind of funny. Calvin Holt says eight and Fred or Amy are his favorite ones, even though he's been on the show. You got to be your biggest fan. Come on, Calvin. You got to be your own biggest fan. Uh, we got another one for, for Fred Dupree. Lee House says Dan Cervantes. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see if we can see here. Oh, Neil Bergstrom's watching in. I know Neil and Angus are good friends. I'm glad to see those guys uh, being here. So we've got uh, – so we said they've watched about 10. Angus Jamison, brilliant inventor. Josh Odo. Josh, thanks for uh, – tuning in i think i scrolled too fast there was something else all right one other question one other request i have for you guys let me put this in the comment section here on linkedin and then i'll copy it over and then uh see if i can get this over onto the youtube side as well i have a huge favor to ask of all of you please subscribe to the youtube channel i am working on a very specific 
uh, LinkedIn or not LinkedIn Live, but it'd be it'll be on YouTube Live. But I cannot broadcast live on YouTube mobily. I can do it from the desktop, but I can't do it like walking around. So there's some type of show that I want to do walking around. I don't want to say it yet because I don't want somebody else to beat me to the punch on this, but it's going to be absolutely amazing. But I got to hit a thousand subscribers first. So if you guys can, please just just subscribe to the channel. I'll do the one show. And if you're like, oh, this is terrible, then you can unsubscribe. I, I completely understand. So uh, Mike Westwood says this is his first show. Mike, thanks for, for tuning in. All right. Enough of the intro stuff. Angus has been patiently waiting or probably not patiently waiting. So welcome to the show, Angus. Thank you so much for being here, sir. I do appreciate it. Hi. I haven't seen you in a while, David. I haven't seen you since you lost your razor. <laughs> yeah, it, it has been a while. I think it was probably on purpose, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been avoiding you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, this COVID thing is just driving everybody crazy. And uh, and you can probably see from the background here, I'm working from home at the moment, uh, trying to, to stay safe. So you all, you all out there, all stay safe. Work from home if you can. So I I know the background of who Angus Jameson, is, Angus Jameson is. Please tell everybody in the industry why they should know who you are and why you really are so important. I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I can give you uh, a succinct life story. I started in directional drilling. My first directional drilling contract was uh, back in 1979, uh, working for a company then known as Teleco Drill Tech. And we were building a big database for them for all their, their drilling tools. Um, I've been in directional drilling mainly offshore uh, for just about 40 years now. Um, I saw that there were opportunities. My background and training were actually in maritime operations, um, anchor handling, pipe laying, diving work, that sort of thing. And uh, the, the positioning systems that we have for underwater are really quite sophisticated. We spend more money on, uh, on sophistication and positioning underwater than we do on space. Um, so it's, it's pretty good stuff. And I basically plagiarized some good ideas from uh, from the marine industry and brought them into the drilling industry and pretended that they were mine. So that was that was how I got started, really. Um, the Compass product, uh, that was oh, way back in the 1980s. We developed the original Compass program. Um, and I had a little company then called JTS. Um, we sold it to Shell and we sold it to BP and we sold it to Chevron. And uh, and then far too many people wanted to use it, so I sold it on uh, to Landmark, and they've they've turned it into an excellent program, a lot better than it was when I had it. So hats off to Landmark. Um, but that gave me opportunity to uh, to visit drilling rigs, actually using the software uh, in anger, sometimes literally, um, <laughs> in different fields around the world. So I was out on rigs in Russia and in Sakhalin and uh, South America, Canada, uh, Southeast Asia. It was great um, getting all this uh, wide experience from all these visits. And then eventually got involved in directional drilling training. And that's where most people know me from. I used to do a lot of training for Shell and BP, ConocoPhillips, Total. Uh, they would use me as their directional drilling uh, trainer. So that got my name around as well. And then the ISC WSA, um, that's been a, a, a great uh, project altogether since its inception, uh, improving standards and sharing knowledge. Um, and I was the chairman of the ISC WSA uh, for about five years um, and really got to know a lot of people through that as well. So that's, that's my background. And if you've been involved in any of these areas, you might have heard of me. And if you have heard of me, I'd like you to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so uh, ISCWSA, let's let's definitely plug this book because I'm on the education subcommittee, so it's part of my duty to be able to make sure that people are aware of this. But for everybody that that didn't quite come in the way I wanted it to, but there's the book. It's called Introduction to Wellboard Positioning. And so if you have not read this book, if you don't have the download, please look this up. 
I don't have the link. Maybe Fahim, if he's watching, can drop the link in the uh, in the comment section for us. But Angus had a little bit to do with that book. Just here. Yes, um, I suggested that uh, that we come up with a book because it wasn't actually a good book on wellboard positioning um, that was readily available. Uh, so I didn't write the whole book. I uh, got in other experts in other areas and we compiled the book together and put it out through the ISCWSA. And if I'm allowed to do a little plug at this point, um, the book was hosted by the University of the Highlands and Islands, where I'm a visiting professor here in Inverness. And um, we put together a course based on the book. So the book is the course material, if you like, uh, but there's an online course that you can do through the University of the Highlands and Islands. And um, if you go on to the ISCWSA website, you'll be able to see links there as to how you can enroll on that, that course. It's an online course. Um, next one's starting uh, on the 2nd of November. So book early to avoid disappointment. We've already got some students lined up for that one, but uh, we've plenty of spaces. Are, are, we, are you guys still doing the, if you are a, as the SBE calls it, a member in transition? Is there still the opportunity for, for those individuals to be able to get a discounted course rate? Uh, not on that course because it's not actually an SPE course. It's a it's a standard university CPD course, um, continuous professional development. So it's about eight weeks of uh, four hours a week. So you're doing it in your own time, and then at the end of it, it's an exam, and you sit the exam, you get a certificate to say that you are now a fully competent expert in wellbore positioning, and you can ask your boss for more money. <laughs> So if Todd's watching, obviously Angus teaches the class. So every time somebody learns it, he should get more money as well. Right? Yeah, Todd, Todd is listening, but he's pretty impervious to pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I should say uh, thank you to Adrian, Adrian Lidros, he, uh, who is the current ICWSA uh, uh, is program chair. So he's it's Ross Loudon, who's our like our leader. And then Adrian Ledros, and then Mark Willard also posted, and Mark is our outreach director. Um, so thank both of them for being able to post that, and then also Fahim posted it. Thanks, Fahim. All right. So today we're here to talk about wellboard tortuosity and not just all the other fun stuff about Angus. So this is probably the thing that everybody's tuning in to watch. And if you if you can, please tag your friend. Share the stream. This is all free. This is for the betterment of the entire industry. And this is for anybody who's ever had to argue about World War Tortuosity or anything like that down hole. Here we can have some substance to be able to back up either side of the argument. So, Angus, with that, I will turn it over to you, sir, um, sure. and let you uh, start the presentation. So if you guys have any questions while we're doing this, please fire them off and I'll be sure to get them over to Angus and get your questions answered. So here we go, add to stream. Angus, your your PowerPoint presentation is up and it is all you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I don't really need to do my introduction. So I'm now looking after the, uh, the small uh, UK research team for Helmer campaign um, in the UK. Um, done all the introduction and everything, so we don't need to mention that again. Why is tortuosity important? Um, it's very interesting. Over the last few years, I've had a lot of questions from uh, mainly from operator clients, just asking about the quality of, of well bores and how we can assess the quality of the drilling. Um, one of the issues is that uh, tortuosity is broadly understood as a concept, but we don't really have an industry standard way of defining it or measuring it. Um, I think there's something like 13 different tortuosity indices available in the industry. So uh, with that number, uh, clearly if somebody says, well, I've just drilled a well with a 7.5, it doesn't really mean anything uh, in the industry. So I've got a hidden agenda here um, as part, again, of the Education Committee on the ISCWSA, we would really love to have an agreed standard on tortuosity indices. 
So I did a bit of a study to see what everyone else had done and what conclusions they'd come to. Uh, and this presentation hopefully gleans from all of these. Um, best of the best, hopefully. So why is it important? Well, it increases torque and drag while drilling. That's fairly obvious. Perhaps less obvious is it actually reduces buckling resistance in drill pipe. It also increases drill strength fatigue when you're rotating. It impedes hole cleaning while you're drilling. It increases drag when you're running casing. And uh, actually, it's interesting. I heard in the introduction, uh, one of my old chums, uh, Bill Lesso, um, from Schlumberger, uh, he, he said uh, it can compromise the cement job quality. Uh, and that's uh, clearly an important part of this. Um, yes, I've got even more reasons. It causes variations in cross-section due to cutting straps, and so it can affect production rate. Um, I say it can, it doesn't always, but it can. And we'll, we'll quantify that a little bit later on in the presentation. It can reduce production quality, and it can compromise survey accuracy um, with the consequence that it makes geosteering more uncertain and compromises geological modeling accuracy. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that because uh, my old pal Ed Stockhausen, um, when I started in the, uh, the drilling industry, Ed was just approaching retirement. I think he was born in the, in the 18th century. And he came up with um, some really interesting studies about how tortuosity was, uh, was affecting our well path position and our assessment of where we are. And the impact that that has on the geological modeling is really quite marked. Uh, so I'll leave him to go to, into that in more detail. But these are just the reasons why we need a tortuosity index. Okay, uh, let's have a look at some ways to measure tortuosity then. What we used to do in the olden days was we would just take the survey and plot the dog leg severity uh, against measured depth. Um, this well is a well in Norway, uh, drilled back in the 1980s, and uh, we're looking at tortuosity there just as a wiggly line. Uh, it's very easy to calculate. Um, it's relatively easy to compare uh, one set of survey data against another because it's using the survey data, so it's great. It's easy to understand. Uh, however, the less you survey, the better you look. So. If I survey every 30 feet, um, I'm going to pick up all the dog legs that I did when I was doing a slide rotate pattern, for example. Uh, if I survey every 500 feet, it doesn't look like I've created much in the way of dog legs. And so um, it, it has a weakness that we may miss key points. And there's also no simple comparison. You can bring up two wiggly lines uh, and look at them and one might be wigglier than the other. Uh, but that's not really telling you very much that you can quantify. Okay, one of the things that we can do is to differentiate the dog leg severity curve. So we're looking at the change in dog leg severity over measured depth. Now, this is the same well. Um, this, is, this is really measuring consistency. So we don't, with this method, we don't penalize someone who's putting in 10 degree per 100 dog legs when he's drilling a curve that's supposed to be at 10 degrees per 100. So if he is at 10 degrees per 100 in this stand and he's 10 degrees per 100 in the next stand and 10 degrees per 100 in the following stand, that's not, under this argument, increasing the tortuosity. Uh, he's being consistent. So by measuring the rate of change of dog leg severity, we're actually measuring, in effect, the unwanted curvature put into the well bore. Okay, so this method, it does measure consistency. It doesn't penalize planned curvature. Uh, it's still only using pulsed surveys, and so in that case, it might miss some key points. Again, there's no simple comparison, but the worst thing about this is it's so hard to explain. What does 0 0.0002 degrees per foot squared mean to your average person on the drill floor? Um, not very much, but uh, it does have that, that advantage of measuring consistency. So let's just explore it a little bit further and see if we can come up with a simpler way of making use of this. 
Now, I've always found in presentations that if I want to look intelligent, put in a, an integral sign and people will think you're smart. Um, but if you can put two integral signs in there, boy, people are just intimidated with your intelligence. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm double uh, integrating that last curve. Simple way to think of this is I'm just adding up the area under the curve, plotting that, and then taking the area under that. The effect of it is, if you can imagine, the dog leg severity is in degrees per length. The differential of dog leg severity is degrees per length squared. When I integrate it the first time, it goes back to degrees per length, integrate it again, and I'm left with a number in degrees. And what it is, it's the it's the accumulated unwanted curvature that you've created in the well bore. So this is a plot of that same well from Norway. And we see that after 15,000 feet of drilling, uh, they had put about 25 degrees of additional curvature into the well bore. So if they'd followed the plan exactly and drilled consistent dog legs in the, in the build sections and drop sections and so on, um, that would have accumulated to zero, but they've got 25 degrees of unwanted curvature. Okay, if the maths was covered up with a bit of masking tape, people would quite like this. It does measure consistency. It doesn't penalize planned curvature. It provides unwanted curvature, but it's still got that weakness that it only used the pulse surveys and may miss key points. Okay, but we can come up with a very simple tortuosity index using this technique. The tortuosity index I've suggested is the unwanted curvature divided by the total curvature minus unwanted. And that's akin to the unwanted over the planned, if you like. So if we had the plan, we would always compare the survey against the plan, but we don't always have the plan when we're going in and looking at wells after the event. But we can assume that if we take the unwanted curvature and divide it by the total curvature minus that addition, then it's something approaching unwanted over planned. Okay, now, um, oh dear, I've forgotten her name. Uh, there was a very clever lady in Shell, uh, Theresa Gunberg. Um, she did some studies where she recommended that you don't look at dog leg severity as, uh, as just a numeric. Look on it as a vector. In other words, it's got, it's got a left-right component and an up-and-down component. And unless you separate these out, you can make some pretty awful mistakes. For example, if we had a BHA designed to give a constant dog leg severity, we might be able to produce good consistency when 3D arcs are, are uh, assessed for curvature. But what if one survey interval was a build followed by a drop, followed by a build, and it looks like this? Clearly, that's a tortuous well path. So if we had the constant curvature, though, that would assess as consistent dog leg severity from one survey to the other. And so that wouldn't show up using some of the tortuosity indices that are out there. So using Shell's recommendation, it's better if we assess a tortuosity index for the build consistency and the turn consistency separately and then combine them into a single index. So I've pinched that idea uh, in my recommendations in this presentation. Okay, calculating a high side and a lateral tortuosity. First of all, uh, calculate the build rate and turn rate for each interval. That's easy to do. Convert the turn rate to a lateral dog leg severity, sometimes called effective turn. And that's not the azimuth change. It's like the curvature across the well bore from left to right. So if you're looking down the well, these two components are genuinely at right angles to each other, an up and down bend and a left and right bend across the well bore. That effective turn rate is just the azimuth change times the sign of the inclination. And you can just use the average inclination for the interval when you're calculating that. So if you're doing this in a spreadsheet, it's very easy. So then we calculate the change in build rate 
and the change in the ETR from one interval to the next as absolute values. Now, the advantage of doing that is, remember, we're trying to measure consistency in the curvature. So if we looked at the build rate, for example, and we see the build rate is changing from one to the other, then what I'm really interested in is not so much the actual build rate itself, but these changes. So I'm looking at the area under the curve, under that histogram, for these triangles in here. So my total build is the shaded area on the left, and my unwanted build is the area of the triangles. And similarly, my total ET is the sum of the effective turn rates multiplied by their changes in measure depth. And my unwanted ET is half of the change times the change in measure depth. Um, this, this is a very useful way of uh, providing the, the formula in a way that can be put into a spreadsheet very simply. So the high side tortuosity index is the unwanted build divided by the total build minus the unwanted. And the lateral tortuosity index is the unwanted effective turn divided by the total effective turn minus the unwanted effective turn. If everyone's still listening and hasn't lost the will to live, I congratulate you. Um, just bear with me for a little bit longer. One of the things that has improved dramatically over the last few years is more and more companies are using continuous uh, MWD data. And that continuous data, it might be noisy and it might even have a bit of an offset, but it tells you a lot more about the shape of the well uh, than just taking the pulsed surveys. The problem is there's an awful lot of it. So here's some continuous data and you can see the azimuth is rising uh, fairly consistently, but the inclination looks like it rising and then falling slightly and then rising again. And this is just a slide rotate pattern in a curve where you've got the, the, um, the BHA is in slide mode here and then it's in rotate mode and it's dropping angle a little bit. It's probably at quite high angle anyway. Okay, so how can we use this? Because if we try and assess tortuosity index for something that's jumping around like this, it will look like thousands of little micro dog legs accumulating into a very large tortuosity index. Well, this technique uh, uses all available data. It assesses true motor yield functions, which is great. That's a useful byproduct. Um, it models a true trajectory in 3D. So the Stockhausen effect is, is cured by using that, that data. Um, it doesn't miss key points. It's measuring you know, really quite uh, frequently. Um, it informs your torque and drag and hydraulics calculations as what you actually drilled. Um, and also it helps to train directional drillers or automation to minimize tortuosity. And it allows a proper assessment of the impact at two thresholds of tortuosity. I say two thresholds because if we create a wiggly hole, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to create wiggly casing going down it. There's a point at which the tortuosity reaches uh, such a variation that we're actually stressing casing when we run it down there. And there's a second threshold when you're actually stressing drill pipe, and that will eat your lunch. That, that will create so much torque and drag uh, that you can potentially be uh, losing weight on bit uh, when, you're, when you're drilling ahead. Um, don't worry about all this uh, formula here, but uh, for example, if we have a dog leg severity of 10 degrees per 100 and we're running 13 and 3 eighths casing in 17 and a quarter inch hole, then we can drill 28 feet uh, before we would actually, that curve would actually cause stress on the casing. In other words, casing straight and the annular gap is wigg wiggling us around the casing. Okay, in this diagram here, this is a little piece of software that will take the survey and we'll look at when you're stressing casing and when you're stressing drill pipe. So we look at the, the tortuosity from the continuous data and then we look at a straightened view and if the blue area encroaches on the yellow, then you've got wall contact on the casing. If it encroaches on the red, you've got wall contact on the, um, 
the drill pipe. Okay, with this, it allows us then to calculate the direction and size of all the side forces in a torque and drag calculation. Um, that's just increasing at the end because you're into the BHA at that point. But, but you can see, like in this curve here, that the angle at which the side forces are acting uh, is changing dramatically. And we've got a lot of side force in this curve, and then it builds up again in, the, in this second curve round here. Okay, so a simple approach. Uh, how do we use that um, uh, that continuous data? If we use the 3D tortuosity index for drilling performance on normal surveys, with the caveat that normal tortuosity index values should be assessed for local scenarios, and they should be assessed for different hole sections, and then we also normalize the high resolution sections using a method called the arc to cord threshold method. Now, this was something that uh, was developed in uh, conjunction with Conical Phillips. Um, and uh, I've suggested a common standard of half an inch. In other words, we're saying we're only going to include surveys where the curvature created by the survey is enough that we've actually moved half an inch off a straight line. Um, and that's a, is a really useful way of uh, taking your continuous data and isolating the points that are really relevant from a, a tortuosity point of view. So it ignores the micro dog legs within the annular gap. It can be used with continuous data and it more accurately indicates casing or completion risks. We'll see how this works uh, in practice. So let's say when the observations are less than 10 feet apart, the dog leg severity might be exaggerated. Noise looks like tortuosity, but if we advance along the surveys until the arc to cord correction exceeds half an inch and repeat, then what happens is, uh, I'll leave this maths in there for the maths geeks to look at afterwards if they get a copy of the presentation. But what we can then do is pick survey points and you can see here points being picked by the arc to cord where when the tortuous, when the curvature is quite sharp, there are more points. And when it's fairly straight, there are less points. And then we include these picked surveys in our tortuosity analysis. And that lets us use the continuous data without causing unnecessary alarm. Uh, I think I've got a little video here of software at work doing that. So. This is inclination data on the bottom line, azimuth data on the top line, and it's just working its way along. And when the arc to cord correction exceeds half an inch, it picks a survey point and lists it. And then it will embed that along with the discrete surveys off bottom before we run the tortuosity analysis. Incidentally, doing this also gives you a more accurate well position at the end. Okay, so how does 3D tortuosity index work in practice? Um, well, we did a, a study of 1,400 wells in HMP. Uh, they were supplied by various operators, various depth, various profiles and locations. And uh, it was quite interesting. We had, uh, this, is, this is like a high side tortuosity and it was spreading around one. Uh, this was the uh, lateral, uh, tortuosity uh, left and right of the well bore and we simply took these two values and took the sum of the squares took the square root of that to get the 3d tortuosity index and it was quite a nice normal distribution yeah and you can see that round about for that, these 1400 wells round about 2.5 seemed to be the average by the time you got above four you would really be looking at that and saying is that well uh going all over the place um, here's some data from a single operator, uh, Conical Phillips won't mind me telling you, they did a very detailed study on this, um, and I think there was something like 2,000 wells were looked at there, but they looked at two separate business regions, um, and they've got fairly similar sort of patterns with about 2 to 2.5 uh, being in the normal range. The study was done by the University of Tulsa under Professor Mike Stafford, um, which was partly sponsored by uh, HMP. And uh, this was his team. And they were looking at 
uh, is there any uh, relationship between tortuosity and production? Um, this was an interesting graph. They said, well, let's just take the average tortuosity and the average production, and we'll call that the origin. And as the tortuosity increases, is there any loss in production? And you can see that there's, there's some correlation there. Now, of course, there's always one uh, that breaks the trend, but uh, in these uh, formations here, um, there seemed to be an increase in production loss uh, between wells that had tortuosity under control and wells that didn't. Um, this was using the, um, the, the data was available because we have a, a bit guidance system um, which will manage the, the drilling. Um, and you could compare those that had BGS with those that didn't have BGS and the impact on production. Now, these are perhaps not huge numbers, but it showed that there was some correlation. Um, the other thing that was interesting was when we ran the tortuosity index, we had uh, three different tortuosity indices that we were trying. Um, the Angus TI here, the 3D one, um, when uh, in Texas, uh, when we were looking at an HMP well, um, 2.4 offset wells, 2.5, North Dakota, 1.7 against 1.9. Uh, this sounds like a sales pitch for H&P. Uh, Let H&P do your drilling. It will always be cheaper, better, and higher quality. Did I say that out loud? Um, so it's just interesting that normal varies from formation to formation. Um, probably running out of time to go into this in detail, but it was just very interesting that what is a normal tortuosity index is actually whole section dependent and it was um, uh, regionally dependent. So you have to know what normal is for the type of well that you're drilling, the position in the well, and the uh, formation that you're drilling through. Um, okay, so this graph here was a direct comparison of uh, production success against tortuosity. Um, if, if it was clear, there would be a definite trend that as you got to higher um, uh, tortuosity indices, you would see a reduction in production. Um, there is a drop, but to say that it was a clear uh, trend, I'm not sure that we can say that. But all these other um, benefits of having a less tortuous well still stand, and there is some evidence that improved tortuosity helps production. Um, just a quick summary then from our 2000 well analysis. Uh, in the vertical, the average was three, bad was five. In the curve, the average was 1.5 and bad was 2.5. There's a, there's a higher wanted curvature in the, the curve. So we would expect that the tortuosity index would be less uh, in the curve. And then in the lateral, again, the average was three and bad was five. So some conclusions, um, tortuosity increases torque and drag and risk of tool or casing fail, failure. It certainly doesn't help production and may even hinder. 3D tortuosity indices are better than 2D. Um, the Jameson formula is as good as any. I don't mind if somebody wants to standardize on another one, uh, but it would be really nice to have a standard tortuosity index where everyone's looking at the same thing to compare apples with apples. So a standard calculation would be helpful to the industry. Uh, now, uh, Peter Clark in Chevron, very kindly, he's a much better mathematician than I am. Uh, he took the mathematics of this and made a, a, a spreadsheet, um, which he's quite happy to distribute. So if anybody would like a copy of the spreadsheet to do tortuosity analysis, uh, give me a shout and I can send on the work that uh, that Pete has has done. Um, can I just ask a quick question at the end here? Will everyone be allowed a copy of this presentation um, at the end of the, the presentation? Uh, so what we can do is we can post a link to it uh, on LinkedIn uh, and allow everybody who wants to be able to go and download it can download it. Okay, right, right. We'll do that. 
That's fine. So that answers one of the questions somebody asked. Can we get a copy? Thanks in it. Thank you in advance. Yes, you can. Yeah, so sure. I will definitely do that and put that up for everybody on there. So we do have a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, hold on, let me find it. Let me find it. Here we go. If you do not have the capability of real-time inclination and azimuth readings, what survey interval would be the minimum for this method to be valid? Um. We have a, a recommendation in the ISCWSA error models um, that really you don't want to have survey intervals of, of uh, any more than 100 feet before you would be saying, look, you just haven't characterized the shape of that well. Um, so I would say it's probably similar, but clearly the more often you read um, the the better your uh, assessment of the, the wellbore position and the wellbore shape. So it's a little bit subjective, but uh, you wouldn't want the intervals to be more than 100 feet. All right. Uh, let's see who was this thing. Uh, so we've got a question from YouTube. Paul says, what about methods such as advanced spline curve method as a solution? The math should yield the tortuosity metrics needed without requiring continuous inclination azimuth, which in old wells is not always available. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the the spline, curve, uh, spline curve method is a way of la allowing curvature in the wellbore to vary. So it's not, uh, you know, minimum curvature, which is a standard way of calculating, assumes that the radius is constant from one well to the next, from one survey point to the next. And the spline curve allows that to vary. Um, but it's still, it's still a geometrical model of what is happening in the wellbore. So if I take a survey every 90 feet, um, I could do anything I like between these two surveys, uh, and I still have no record of it. Uh, the spline curve is still joining the dots as is minimum curvature. And I would say that the spline curve will give you a better assessment of tortuosity than minimum curvature does, but it's a tough change to go back and change all the software uh, and I'm just being practical about it. Most people are using a minimum curvature calculation to get from one survey point to the next. Very true. Next one was, uh, can we back calculate our old surveys to include what we know, what we now think the torque velocity was? Yes, um, because we're not using the plan to measure the consistency, we are looking at just the survey data itself, then all you need is a list of measure depth, inclination, and azimuth, which could be from the 1960s, um, and you could do a tortuosity index um, for that historic survey. Now, a question from uh, Mr. Calvin Holt. Can you please comment on how this could affect hole cleaning? Yeah. Um, it, it's again, it's a little bit subjective, it's difficult to quantify. But um, if we have, if we were to produce some data, and this would be an interesting study, produce some data on uh, wells we had real difficulty with hole cleaning and where we had, um, you know, chippings burying our, our uh, drill string, uh, and compare the tortuosity index of that against wells that were drilled more smoothly. It would be a very interesting study, but uh, just empirically, clearly, if we've got a very tortuous well bore, there's plenty of places where uh, chippings can just sit out of the flow, so to speak, um, and, and be left there. So we're not cleaning the hole effectively if the hole isn't smooth. So this next question, I'm going to have to comment before because i know you know this individual and i know exactly what they're doing here but i'm still going to throw this one up there so harold bolt would like to ask and it's very interesting as always so how does tortuosity affect a long hole depth and how does it affect uncertainty of this measurement okay um we're still using the observed a long hole depth so if the if the wellbore has an a long hole depth and an inclination and an azimuth, 
we're still calculating an arc and we're assuming, we're assuming, I say, that the measured depth difference um, is accurate. So the, the tortuosity index is being based on our observed measured depth. Um, from that point of view, uh, it's the only data we've got. If we were to go in and correct the measured depth for stretch, for temperature, uh, and so on, um, I don't think it would have any impact on the tortuosity. The actual tortuosity index that you would come up with for that well would be the same whether or not you'd used a corrected measured depth or, um, or the original measured depth as observed. And just for anybody that's out there, I think Harold uh, recently published a book uh, online as far as uh, a long hold depth measurement. I can't, I, I just saw the clip before. I didn't get to read everything about it, but I know that he did publish something recently that's out there for you guys to be able to go and check out. So be sure to look for that. Um, Fahim has a question. Can I just say one more thing on, on, uh, on Harold's point, though? Um, yes. When, when we have a highly tortuous well, we also have high torque and drag. And when we have high torque and drag and we lift up off bottom, we stretch more drill pipe and we create more depth there. So although the accuracy of the measured depth doesn't have a direct effect on the tortuosity index, I would argue that a high tortuosity index probably also means that you've got more stretch in there than you think you have and so your depth accuracy suffers as a result. There we go. So the next one is, can you talk a little bit about how tortuosity affects wellbore stability? Well, that's that's a really interesting one. Um, have we got another four hours? Um, yes, we do. Yeah, perfect. I mean, you're not doing anything tonight. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the, the issue here is that um, if you're drilling a smooth well, you imagine like a tunnel, and you drill a smooth well uh, through a formation that is, um, is anisotropic. I love that word. But where the, the, um, the, the layers are not, they're not homogeneous in all directions. Every time we cross a, a boundary from one to the other, let's say we're tortuous in the, in the y-axis, so we're, we're coming up and down in TVD, and we're breaking through our stack of pancakes, we're actually weakening that formation and creating a situation where uh, the, the stability is being compromised. It's exactly like, um, you know, if you took a stack of pancakes and you stuck a knitting needle through vertically, you'll be able to push all the way through. But if you try and go in horizontally, you'll push one of the pancakes out and the rest will collapse down on top of you. So unless the layers, uh, are completely homogeneous, then the smoother the hole that you can drill, the less likely you're, you're going to have spalling into the, the well bore as you penetrate these, these layer boundaries. So I would argue that tortuosity is just bad news for everything, but it's probably particularly bad news for well bore stability. So we've got... Um... It's a series of questions and it was put in two different comments here, but essentially asking uh, Oscar saying, uh, have you seen any difference in um, World War Tortuosity with different drive systems? So like RSS versus a bent motor. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and uh, rotary steerable uh, will generally give you a smoother well bore. Um, but unfortunately, it depends on how you surveyed it. <laughs> so... Uh, it's, it's one of these questions, uh, the answer is, depends. Um, if I use an RSS and, uh, and I go in and, and set um, a tool face with this RSS and I drill a nice smooth curve, then the start and the end of the curve will have a survey. And that survey will have some curvature associated with it. If I did exactly the same thing with a mud motor uh, BHA, and um, let's say I was using a slide ratio of 50%. Um, I'm supposed to be drilling a six degree per hundred curve. I probably drill a 12 degree per hundred for 50 feet and, uh, and rotate out the, the, the last part. Problem is, 
from a survey point of view, which is all I've got to measure my tortuosity with, if I've got a long survey interval and it doesn't pick up the fact that I was using a slide rotate pattern, the tortuosity index will look the same. So in order to get the benefit, you really have to survey frequently enough to be able to characterize that well bore. And when you're honest about characterizing the well bore, you'll get an honest tortuosity index. I remember years and years ago, um, Shell introduced a penalty for tortuosity. And uh, there was one company that every now and again, when you analyze the data coming in from them, obviously I can't say who it was, but we were looking at the data independently for Shell. And they would just drop out a survey now and again. And you say, well, what was that? Well, it was mud pulse telemetry failure. And it was quite clear that they were doing very sharp corrections by ojiving back to plan uh, with a very aggressive BHA. But that's not so bad if you lose the survey at the point in the middle of the ojive. So as you curve to the left and then curve to the right, if you end up parallel, your inclination and azimuth are still the same as they were at the start. So as long as you don't survey at the point of inflection, then your tortuosity index is okay. Um, Unfortunately, it was Shell they were working for, and they're far too smart to have the wool pulled over their eyes like that. <laughs> <laughs> so they got all over the coals for it. But uh, yeah, um, if, if you have an honest survey, you'll have an honest tortuosity index. So this one's from uh, Samir. Is there any effect on high tortuosity of drilled wells on deploying artificial lift or even perforation gun design? I'm afraid I'm out of my depth with that question. Um, perhaps someone else can go into the chat and uh, I, I know very little about artificial lift. That's what I always tell people. It's like once, once we hit TD, I'm pretty much clueless what happens out at the rig site. They, just tell, <laughs> they tell the MWD guys to leave. And so I, I honestly don't know what happens afterwards. I, I show up at the rig, it's there, I leave, come back and the rig's there. I don't know what happens in between. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Sammy, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, Gregory asks, wouldn't bit diameter slash casing diameter have some influence on acceptable, unacceptable uh, tortuosity index values? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, and that's why I said that, uh, well, two things I said in the presentation which are really relevant to this, and it's a good point that uh, Gregory brings up. It's not possible, unfortunately, with a tortuosity index just to say three is okay and five is bad because uh, it depends on what it's doing to you. And if you're drilling very slim hole, or you're drilling, you know, six and a half inch hole or something like that, um, you don't have to be very tortuous to create enormous torque and drag with side forces on the drill pipe. And if you're drilling a very large hole, um, a lot of our curvature in offshore drilling is done in 17 and a half inch hole even. Um, it's, it's possible to curve 17 and a half inch hole where you've got drill pipe in the middle of that. It's not really going to create much of a side force against the whole wall with a 17 and a half inch bit uh, or even a 12 and a quarter inch bit. So Greg's absolutely right. Uh, bit diameter and casing diameter have, uh, have a huge influence on what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. But if the, if the method of calculation is the same, then at least that part of the uncertainty can go out. And you can say, well, when we're drilling these offshore wells in northern Norway, we would expect that uh, the index of about 2.5 is good. And if we start going up above four, we'll have a look at it. And that might not apply in North Dakota or something. You know. get, yeah, give you the chance to normalize some of the data there. Yes. Uh, so, Divine has, how do you prevent tortuosity effect due to borehole spiraling? Uh, analyze, analyze the drill string in advance and, uh, and try and take the the wall out of it or get the uh, bit manufacturer to give you a bit more stability. Um, if, if the BHA is designed well, you'll drill a smooth, you'll drill a smooth path and that will show up. Um, but 
it's interesting that uh, spiral filling as such doesn't really show up in surveys unless you go down to very low resolution. Because, because the spiral, if you like, the spiral can have uh, uh, quite a significant amplitude and not have much of a difference in inclination and azimuth. And we're defining tortuosity as inclination and azimuth changes. Uh, so spiral drilling may not necessarily be picked up by that to the same extent. Excellent. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. So from somebody who's been on the show previous, and I think uh, Angus knows this person, Dan, has there been any integration of downhole force measurement in the analysis of uh, torque velocity index calculations? Bending in the BHA or drifting, for example. Um, there may have been. I, I'm not aware of it. I do know that there's been some very uh, detailed studies looking at torque and drag against tortuosity, uh, but not necessarily with, um, you know, like a downhole sensor measuring the stresses on the BHA. But um, you know, if somebody wants to pay us to do that, we'll we'll do anything for money. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Uh, how successful have dog leg rumors been in reducing well bore torch velocity in your experience? Um, I've got very little experience, really, of measurements before and after dog leg rumors have been used, but experiences I do have is it very often just postpones the problem either further up the well or further down the well. Uh, so really sharp dog legs um, are, are bad news and just reaming through it, um, it can ease it off but it very often just creates problems either further up the well or further down the well. Mm. I, I would like to ask Ali what what uh, what experience he has. Am I allowed to ask questions of the people? That hey, Angus, this this is your show today. Nobody tunes in to watch me. They're tuning in to watch you. So 100% of you. I don't know enough. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We, I, I'll say this. The questions are definitely coming in, and I'll ask you guys, please um, share this. Uh, tag one of your friends in the comments. Uh, tag a colleague in the comments or tag your arch enemy in the comments um if you if you want to have them uh listen to all of our nonsense anyways just just share this so that we can get it out there to even more people uh let's see here how can we torque velocity con concept in the well planning phase instead of actual well survey great question yeah that's a good one um in the well planning stage um one of the things that that creates problems in the field from a, a bad well plan is where the dog leg severity is planned uh, a little bit too high. And sometimes there's a temptation. If we take a very simple example, uh, if I want to, to have a lateral that's as long as possible in the P zone, one of the ways of doing that is to say, well, uh, I'll have a, a kickoff depth that's really deep and I'll build at 25 degrees per 100, and I'll be in the pay zone, and I won't leave any production shadow underneath that curve. Um, great, but the, 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 the BHA that is capable of doing that is also capable of generating enormous tortuosity, and especially if we want to do one BHA run, and that BHA is quite aggressive, and you're going to use the same BHA in the, uh, in the uh, lateral for doing your adjustments as you had in the curve and it was very aggressive, then you're creating problems for yourself later in the well. So if we, if we were to, to sit down with the well planners and the directional driller who's had to drill the last well that he sent out and say, what problems did you experience? And he says, do you know what? Um, if we were to just take two degrees per hundred off that build curve, it would make a huge difference to the assembly that I've then got in the lateral to make my adjustments. 
I, I'm building up such a lot of tortuosity because I've got a client that wants me to paint the line uh, and, I, and I'm ending up with, with uh, torque and drag problems. I can barely get the weight on the bit towards the end of the well. If we, if we discuss these things between the well planner and the DD and we ease off on the aggression with which we use mud motors and rotary steerables, I would argue, um, we can improve the well quality and improving the well quality can often buy you time. So you might be able to drill a really fast curve and then because you had an assembly capable of drilling a really fast curve, it creates enough torque and drag in the lateral that you've actually eaten your own lunch. Why not take the time to drill a smoother curve and yeah, take an extra 12 hours to drill the curve. But if it saves you 24 hours in drilling the lateral, on balance, you're going to be quids in. So there's all sorts of areas where uh, if the well planners and the DDs actually delivering the wells could discuss things with each other, there's huge benefits to be had. We're not allowed to talk to each other. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more example that was quite common in the North Sea. You used to quite often see the same cookie cutter well plan come out to the field over and over again. And we soon learned that you just ignore the well plan and you drill what will give you the smoothest well because that's what gets you your bonus. You get to the TD faster. So a typical example, we might have a well that builds up to uh, 60 degrees of inclination and then has this long sail angle out at 60 degrees of inclination. And we were trying to do this with uh, a mud motor. So you're drilling your curve and you go into the, the straight section and you've still got a motor with a bent housing in there. Um, with that mud motor and bent housing, as we go into that long sail section, we're rotating ahead and we're dropping half a degree per hundred or something. But these tangent sections were like 5,000, 6,000 feet long. So every now and again, you've lost three or four degrees. You go in and you slide the high side and you create a big dog leg in there. And then you go in and you start rotating again and you drop and you have to recover the high side and build and so on. And you end up with this undulation that goes all the way down that section that was supposed to be low torque and drag. Okay, so if we then have a discussion with the well planner and we say, look, don't take us up to 60 degrees. We can't hold 60 degrees. When we rotate ahead, we drop half a degree per hundred. So next time, take us up to 70 degrees and, and then build into the well plan a great long slow drop of half a degree per hundred. And when we go in there, we'll build up to that higher inclination before we go into the tangent. And then the tangent is actually a long slow drop, which is exactly what our BHA is gonna do in the field. And we get a low torque and drag uh, uh, profile and from that we're now rotating the whole way there's no slides involved in that long drop so it looks ugly but it works great from a directional driller's point of view Th these are just these are just some examples but we used to find that if you were rotating you'd be three times the penetration rate than when you're sliding so tortuosity is a measure of the wasted time in some some cases so back to the presentation and uh, Hassan, thank you for that question. Excellent question. Uh, was production impact due to tortuosity made on the basis of predicted rates not being met? Um, no, um, no, it was literally the case that uh, we compared wells where, um, where low tortuosity uh, techniques were being used on the rig with wells where uh, it was just conventional directional drilling, we then ran the tortuosity uh, index on that and tried to see if there was any correlation between the smoother wells and the higher production wells. Um, I would love to say that it was clear uh, and that you should, you, you know, you should justify low tortuosity on production. It's not as clear as that. Um, but uh, it certainly doesn't improve production by drilling a tortuous well. Somebody says they'll always tune in to see if David's kids will interrupt him again. 
they are at school, so they're not going to be doing any interrupting today. But they do have a day off coming up pretty soon, so maybe they will. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find some more questions. Like a lot of these have been coming in, and I keep losing my place here on on the side, guys. And so, uh, uh, apologize if I lose anything here. Um, so, oops, click the wrong one. As soon, as soon as I go to click on one, somebody. Uh, knowing what and why and when to compromise. Optimal drilling typically always requires compromise. Any uh, comment to that one from from Peter I, out there? I absolutely. Um, well, I could give you a very long answer on this. Um, <laughs> I'm probably going to leave it to Ed Stockhausen. Um, the Stockhausen effect is something that really does mess up our geological modeling. And in directional drilling, we've got to remember that we inherit our own accuracy because when the geologists are going out and modeling that reservoir and what the dips and the strikes are and what the thicknesses are and the depths and all that sort of stuff, they go out with seismic, which only measures in X and Y as a distance. The, the depth component is just a time, the time that it took the signal to go down there and bounce back. And so it's only calibrated by drilling information when we go down and discover these horizons and report them back to the G&G department. So if we report back wrong TVDs, we get a wrong geological model. And so we get wrong targets on the next well from the G&G folks because we've just in included our uncertainty in their uncertainty. So. The end customer, in, in many ways, the end customer is the G&G &G department. And when we're drilling, we're not just drilling for oil, we're drilling for information. They use that information to be able to build a more and more focused lithological model from which we then get our targets. Okay, now we think about the Stockhausen effect. And we say, okay, we're going to go in and we're going to drill with this really aggressive uh, light ratio and... Um, uh, what's the impact on TVD? Well, uh, the Stockhausen effect has a very simple impact on TVD. If you drill a curve from vertical to horizontal and you do it with a slide ratio, you will be out in TVD by one half of your measure depth interval multiplied by one minus your slide ratio. Let me give you an example of that. Half of your measure depth interval, let's say every 90 feet, that's 45 multiplied by one minus your slide ratio, 45 times one minus a half, say, is a 22 and a half foot TVD error, which you will not pick up in the surveys because you surveyed every 90 feet. So what do we do? Well, do we say, well, let's survey every 30 feet and we'll pick up that tortuosity. But if you're going to stop and come off bottom and take a a uh, pulsed survey and then go back on bottom and regain your tool face and so on, you're going to slow down the drilling operation. But because we operate, unfortunately, we operate in silos, the guys who are doing the drilling don't often speak to the geologists and the geologists don't often speak to the well planners and the well planners don't often speak to the programmers that are actually programming this up to tell you where you are. And because of these various silos, coming up with a good compromise to drill optimally is an is a interdisciplinary discussion that very often doesn't happen. So the more we can educate people on the impact of tortuosity and what it's actually doing, not just to the drilling operation, but to the whole geological model, then we can arrive at a compromise. Um, you know, how often do we survey? Maybe we survey every 30 feet when we build faster than five degrees per hundred and we slow it down to every 90 feet when we're in the lateral, unless we've done a stand uh, of sliding or something like that. I don't know. Um, but that's, I'm sorry, Peter, you've, you've opened a can of worms there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really does, it really does need people to talk to each other to come up with that compromise. So the well plan and how often you survey and the requirements of the geological model uh, and what you can do with the BHA and all of that, it needs to be all out on the table at the beginning before we ever make all. So this next one here, let me 
this so this next one uh this question comes in uh i wonder what kind of torch velocity index the uzano well designs are showing and i would imagine it would uh need to be kept pretty low and i'll say this the uzano stuff that you found out uh, about chesapeake and shell were all stories that gibson reports broke to you so just a little plug for us there so <laughs> angus what are your thoughts on those two wells yeah, exactly. You, you would need to keep your tortuosity very low. I mean, in effect, the more curvature you're going to put into the well path, um, the, the more you need to, to control the unwanted additional curvature. So two more questions. Have tortuosities been correlated with formation changes? Yes. Um, yes, there has been some some work done on that, and there are some formations that uh, that seem to to create a very large tortuosity, particularly soft rock where a BHA was designed to drill through it. But every time you hit it, it drops like a stone, and the only way you can recover from that is to slide the high side. Um, so yes, formation changes um, have a have a big impact. But uh, with, with careful planning uh, and especially learning from the previous well, that's the key thing here. Learning from the previous well, the BHAs can be designed to minimize tortuosity for you in, in any collection of formations that you like to drill through if you've recorded well what you did the last time. I have to say this. I'm going to apologize on air. Sorry, one of my clients is calling me. I'll have to call you guys back. Got to got to finish up the show real quick. <laughs> so last one, we'll bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Caitlin Teodoro, who has been on the show previous, and a whole bunch of people are commenting back and forth on this one. Any solid indications of torchuosity fully linked? Let me do this real quick. Any solid indications of torchuosity fully linked to downhole vibrations? My studies have shown that it is possible, but I do not have some good field data. Mm, out of my depth again, I'm afraid. Um, now my colleagues in uh, drill scan they are experts in <laughs> downhole vibration prediction and and uh, critical rotary speeds and all of that sort of thing um they might be able to comment on this but i'm afraid it's not my area of expertise i will say this uh somebody that's going to be on the show in the near future Graham Metz of Wilmot says, Caitlin, you are very correct. It's strongly linked to vibrations and tool failures. So maybe we can save this question for when Graham comes on and let him be able to, to, to address there as well. Um, I'll wrap it up there. Any last words, Angus? No, I just uh, thank you for the, the opportunity, David. It's been great. And um, yeah, uh, tell your friends because... Um, with, with something like this, if we can get to the point, particularly maybe in the ISC WSA, where we can agree on a standard way of calculating it, uh, then the regional variations can all be measured and used uh, with some confidence that we're comparing apples with apples. So that's been my objective all along. And uh, I'm happy if somebody wants to use a different tortuosity index than the one that I've suggested. But we need to get to the point where we declare a standard. Well. Angus, thank you so much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. You can go back to avoiding me now. I'll do that. I'll see you in about four years' time. <laughs> thank you guys all for watching the show. I really do appreciate it. I'm glad to be back doing this. Like I said, next week we've got uh, David Reed, Fred Florence the week after that, Fred Dupree the week after that, um, Steve Mallory or Graham Mitzel Wilmot. We'll get this, the schedule set up between those two guys. Uh, and then after that, uh, it's David Ransom Wood for the I Told You So episode. Um, thank you guys really so much. I really do appreciate all of the support. And once again, please, if you guys would, I, we're at like 429 subscribers on the YouTube channel. We need to get to 1,000 to be able to do the really cool project there. If you guys will go over and just subscribe to it, and then you can unsubscribe after we do the cool project. And if you guys think it was lame, whatever. Um, other than that, we really do appreciate it. If you guys want to get on the mailing list for the show, uh, go to the gibsonreports.com slash Vidor Locksmith. There's a mailing list that we're, we're sending out to be able to kind of update everybody of what shows are coming up. Also, feel free to reach out to me if you guys want to be on the show, um, if you guys are interested in being a part of the How It's Made uh, series, because we, we're kicking that off. We 
put an uh, episode up yesterday. We'll have the season finale with Jared David next week. And then we're going to be kicking off everything for season two coming up. So uh, that's pretty much it from me today. Once again, Angus, thank you for being here. I do appreciate it. And as always, everybody, know your industry. And I didn't queue up the thing again. Ah, I always have to mess up here at the end. All right, hold on. Here we go.